welcome. Uh, today we're going to talk about wall claddings. Wall claddings is a somewhat complicated name for the stuff on the outside of a house. Siding, stucco, stone and brick. And we're going to talk about all of those things. And that I'm just calling it a supervisor's guide because each of those would take a full hour to cover the nuances of. But there are a few things that are important for us to cover and talk about. So wall cladding is the stuff on the outside of a wall. Uh, as I mentioned, it's not really a how-to guide. There's not enough time in an hour to cover all those, but we will be able to cover the key resources and some of the key high points, things that we've found done wrong when we, when we remodel houses, what's leaking, what's not working. So uh, as we know, our subcontracting crews in the DC area are a mixed bag. A lot of people are, have been in it for decades and they really care and they're great, but not all of them. And we're really trying to work to the very top of the level around here. Uh, sometimes you get the new guy or a crew who comes from somewhere else and they're just not that familiar with our area. They may not even know what's considered normal around here, much less we, what we want to add on top of that. So we have to be the ones who are explaining to all these folks um, how they need to do things so that we don't have issues with their work down the road. Here's what we'll talk about today. What's behind the claddings? We'll talk about siding and trim, stucco and masonry, and some of the new stuff that's on the block. There's, there's some interesting stuff out there we've fun to talk about. OK, so this is following on from our last meeting. Uh, what's behind the cladding? We have to have a fully uh, applied shingled weather barrier, water resistive barrier. Um, in our projects right now, we're using Tyvek. It's a very good material. As long as it's lapped and installed correctly, any water that gets through the cladding, and all claddings will leak under some circumstances, will run down the wall and come out through through flashings that we install above uh, at the bottom of the wall and above any penetrations. Uh, it's, I even would go so far as to say that any house should be watertight when we're done with just this base layer. Right? You should be able to spray a hose on the house We've actually had project managers do that on projects where there was bump out windows or other unusual conditions where they really wanted to test it well. So all this backup layer should be completely water resistant. A lot of claddings use another layer as well. And for our projects, we're using felt for this. There's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, first of all, it's, it's for extra protection behind claddings that are known to have water or moisture issues. Uh, one of the neat things with felt is that moisture goes through it more slowly than it goes through Tyvek. So if you have a reservoir cladding uh, it, and the sun hits that cladding that's full of water, this is masonry we're talking about, and it starts pushing moisture in, the felt is more resistant to the moisture coming through. So it's important to have a layer like that in a wall that has a reservoir cladding. And one other cool thing with felt, and this is a picture of a roof, not a wall, the, the felt wrinkles when it gets wet. So if you're doing stucco or adhered masonry and you put felt on and then you smear that wet mortar all over it, it wrinkles the felt. And then that makes little spaces between the felt and the layer behind it. And the people who do research on these things have poured water into walls and watched it trickle down through those tiny spaces and come out the bottom. It makes a really good drainage path. So felt is really good for that. So we're gonna use that on some claddings. And then on the ones that uh, really, really have water issues, we're going to make sure we install a complete drainage path all the way down the wall. And there's a couple of different words for that. This is sort of an emerging thing. A rain screen is uh, what you call it when it's behind siding. Uh, a drainage gap is what you call it when it's behind masonry. But they're all just terms of art. They all mean the same thing. They just mean a space where water can run down. So we're, we're, we'll talk about those. Actually, let's talk about those first because there are a few different ways to do it. Um, the first way is to use a spacer mesh material. And I have some examples of that here. Um, this is just a sort of a, a polyethylene uh, mesh that's molded into a shape. So there's a, a space that when you put it on, and you can put it behind siding, and it won't compress. So it keeps a gap. And then this is a version that's made for using behind stucco and stone. It has a fabric on it, so the mortar can't get into the mesh. So we're using a lot of this. Uh, with the mesh on it, it costs about $1.50 a square foot installed. If you buy the version without the mesh, which you use for siding, it's a little bit less. Um, it's one really nice thing about it, it's about 3 sixteenths of an inch thick, so it doesn't mess up all your trim details. If you use a thicker gap, you can start having to build out around your windows and stuff like that. But this stuff really hardly makes any effect at all. 
What's that? $1. Installed. Dollar fifty. Yeah. Yeah. It adds up. Yep. Yep. Uh, but it's important on some claddings. Uh, here's another. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Can you pass that around? Absolutely. Yep. You'll see there's the thin version and the Canadian version. <coughs> right. So uh, the question is, is it our standard to use this mesh behind lap siding? And the answer is no, not behind lap siding. Uh, this is installed in areas where we're doing vertical siding and diagonal siding, where it is a standard, because those leak way worse than lap siding. You can use it behind lap siding, and it really helps with paint longevity and wall drying, but you do not need to. I actually don't know if we used it behind the lap siding on that project, but that was for other stuff. Oh, okay, so that was driven by a designer, which is I think is a great, great decision. Uh, there are some house wrap products that have little bumps on them. Um, those can be used to make a sort of a drainage gap, but you know these bumps are very, very thin. They're under a sixteenth of an inch, and so you can picture the you know if there's an actual droplet of water, it's going to be touching the stuff on both sides. So there's some questions about how well water will actually drain through there. It'll soak back and forth between the materials. But if you really have no space, uh, this is fine. And it's also less expensive than the mesh products. So we have used this uh, on a couple of projects for one reason or another. There, there's one thing I do want to point out about it, though. The, um, and that is we tried this hydrogap material. And this is an example of us putting up ladders up against it. And it poked holes in it. So the, I don't know if we just got a bad batch. Um, or if it's just not very strong material. Uh, the, the representatives for that material say it, it shouldn't have done that, it won't do that. Um, but anyway, we didn't switch over to using it everywhere because Tyvek just seems to be much more durable on the job site. Okay, here's another way to do a rain screen is to use strips of wood or, you know, there's other materials you can use. Um, th this is uh, very effective but very expensive. Uh, I actually did a section of my own house this way, and I felt like I sided it four times. I used foam board, and then the strips, and then the siding. And I mean, I was out there for like two days. There's a hundred pieces of everything on that on that wall. Um, so this works well. You can see in this example, it's being used in a, a very low energy house where there's two layers of foam board. So the two layers of foam board is too thick for siding to attach to. So really, you're adding a whole other layer for the siding to attach to. And that's what this system is good for. Um, another thing you can use is pre-made plastic strips. You can also buy Coroplast, which comes in sheets. It's just corrugated plastic and throw it through a table saw. Um, a lot of, lot of uh, green builders I know are doing that um, because they want to have a vented siding for a variety of reasons with their walls. Uh, and DuPont makes this one. There's a lot of companies that make them. I even know a guy who just uses strips of sill sealer uh, on the studs behind siding. And that'll work fine. Anything that makes a gap will work fine. And here's another material we've never tried, but I know some of the, like the Canadian building science people have been writing papers about how awesome this is. This is like a dimple sheet membrane that has dimples facing both directions. So it makes an air gap on both sides of it. And you can get phenomenal amounts of moisture control and drying on both sides which is kind of the ideal. Um, it's expensive, it's new, it's experimental. I don't feel like we need to do this, but uh, it might be, you know, if it, if it starts to seem like it's really working out well and the price comes down, we might start using that. So it's good stuff. So does it come out the end and you can see it? <clears throat> uh, you can see, yeah, the question is, does it come out the end and can you see it? So in this example, this is how you'd actually build the wall and then you'd trim it off flush and all you'd see is a bunch of holes, yeah. But you would see a bunch of holes. But that's what this is good for. Um, when you build a brick wall on one of our larger houses, the weep holes provide almost no air ventilation compared to the entire area of a really big house. So this provides a ton of ventilation. It's a, like a quarter inch hole all the way across. So it's actually really good for that. Uh, one important thing with rain screens is you need to screen them to keep bugs from getting in them. Um, and uh, you know we've had we've done a few of these. I know Danny's done a couple of projects. When I came out to one, he had taken rolls of screening and cut them. With, was it with a chop saw or with a circular saw? Yeah. 
So you can, you can make six inch strips of screen with a chop saw. That's what these rolls are here over in the corner. Um, so you just wrap that around the bottom of whatever material you're using to make the screen and keeps the bugs out. Pretty good idea. Okay, so when are we gonna wanna use the rain screen? Uh, as we discussed earlier already, there's, uh, with horizontal siding, there doesn't seem to be a lot of issues with water in those walls. Um, you know, I think in a normal house in our climate, it seems to be fine without it. Uh, there are some questions. If you really increase the amount of insulation in a wall, the outside of the wall will be much colder on average. It won't dry out as well on average. So people are saying it's much safer if you use a vent cavity if you do that. So it might make sense on one of those if we do one. On vertical and diagonal siding, though, we definitely want to use it. Um, I've had, uh, had the opportunity to see uh, behind the walls on a number of vertical and diagonal sided buildings, and they leak a lot. I mean, I don't know, I'm not sure exactly what it is. You'd think tongue and groove, vertical wood, water wouldn't go through it, but it really does. Uh, so we really want to have the maximum drying capacity and draining capacity behind those. So we're going to use a uh, rain screen behind them. Uh, another situation where you have water entry and poor drying is when you're using synthetic trim and panel designs. So PVC, Boral, the guys who provided lunch, thank you, Boral, uh, and uh, metal panels, anything like that where water just cannot evaporate through the material itself, we need to make sure there's a way for the water to get out. And it usually has to be more than just a drainage cavity. It has to be big enough for ventilation. So we want to use like the mesh, not the house wrap. It's especially important on stucco and adhered stone. Um, and the way we build veneer stone these days where there's no gap behind it, we're packing mortar up against the house, we have to have an open cavity behind all that. So we're going to use one of these membranes. Uh, brick is different because the bricks don't touch the house. There's a space behind them. You don't necessarily need to cover the whole wall with it. And we'll talk about what to do with the weep holes too. All right, any questions on rain screens? Go ahead, John. Yeah, clever, clever, yes. So I'm, I'm going to try to not confuse things, but uh, the question is, is the screen behind the felt on this one? Uh, you actually can put an unfaced screen material between the two layers of wrap if you're feeling clever. But you don't have to, and most of our subcontractors, mm -hmm. that makes their head explode, so we don't do that. Um, all right, any other questions? Go ahead. So I assume for any of these situations, siding, stucco, uh, stone, it is the production manager who would contract with whoever the subcontractor is that's doing the installation to make sure that that's included in their bid. Is that generally correct? And then it's the correct. role of the project managers when they're actually on site and commencing to say, hold on if they're not using what they think is the, the standards that you've set out here. So the question is, uh, the, the production manager should contract with for these correct materials to be included in the bid, and the project manager should verify that, and that's correct, everything else being equal. But even if something went awry in the bidding process, we still need to build something that won't fail, so it definitely needs to be brought up. Any other questions? Go ahead. Did you use the mesh for the back or like high or back post Uh-huh. Do you still have to use felt on top of that? That's a great question. So there is a product that's, that's uh, one of these materials, the mesh materials. It has a facer in front, and it comes with a layer of house wrap attached to the back. And, you, and your question is, do you also need another layer? Yeah. You, so, you apply that with the right. texture against the house and then the paper on the back. Uh, you, well, at the end of the day, um, I don't think that really matters to us because when, when we've looked at those products, they seem like when you're looking out in the field, they overlap just fine. But when you think about going around windows with them and ending them, it just doesn't, I don't know how it really works. So we don't use those. Um, so at the end of the day, we're going to do Tyvek and then cover it with one of these anyway. Does that answer the question? Sort of. I think in principle, if you have two layers of paper and one gap membrane, that's what you need behind stucco. So you could do it in any, with any set of materials that you wanted. Okay. Go ahead. I assume when we're designing it in-house, you could have these specs on a sort of 
typical wall section. Sure. So that if it's in the production set, by definition, it's sort of part of the bid. Yeah, this could be part of our drawing, so it's part of the bid. Uh, yep, that could happen. I mean, a lot of these things are written in our subcontractor standards, so they should be part of any bid anyway. Okay. Uh, Larry, just for your information, we proposed that on projects at the very beginning, right? We usually get the project. We get a value engineer that for projects a lot of times. Well, not the things that are our standards. Well, I mean, for, for masonry, it's our standard to have a gap. And, right, but right? I, for example, I would prefer to have a red screen. For all my side projects, but uh, a lot of times if you do an addition to an existing house, to do a main screen on 10% of the house doesn't really make sense. So they get taxed out. There's a lot of different conditions where you just don't want to pay for it. Right. So I think uh, for the question is when do we when are things added in and when are they removed in the budgeting process? I mean I think there's a bottom line. Everything I'm talking about here is really pretty much a bottom line. I would never go below our standards on these. We, we don't, in my opinion, I've never seen an issue with siding that a rain screen would have solved. So I don't think it's needed on horizontal siding. But all these other materials definitely need the gap membrane. So we should not be going below that on these. So hopefully it'll be more clear by the end of this. Right, clients shouldn't be able to eliminate important protections that stop us from having warranty issues later. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on rain screens? One more. Go ahead. If you're doing uh, a horizontal cedar and they're going to take that horizontal cedar side, you still need a gap membrane behind the cedar side and wood side. Uh, I don't think you do. You don't? If it's back primed, the only issues I've ever seen is when it's not back primed. Okay. Yeah. My opinion. Uh, I mean, I'm, if someone else has seen a bad issue, let me know. Uh, but that's my opinion. Um, okay, good, good segue because we're talking about cedar siding. Okay, so uh, at the end of this meeting, we're, everyone's going to get a book. And the book has a bunch of industry standards in it, uh, installation guides, handbooks. And the Western Red Cedar Lumber Association publishes a guide on how to install red cedar siding. And it's applicable to any wood siding. So uh, that's your reference. If you have questions or you're about to put some up, it's a great idea to flip through that. It's only like 20 pages long. Uh, really nice guide. Um, some of the key points that I've seen have issues, and here's, this goes exactly to what you were just asking. Uh, why, don't we put a, why don't we need a gap behind wood siding? Uh, the answer is if you let a wa lot of water in and it's not back primed, you can have a big issue because the water will soak into the wood the extractives from the wood will change the properties of the house wrap and water will get into the, the house itself on the other side of the house wrap. But if you back prime all the wood, which we really need to do because we have had lots of paint and, and uh, extractive bleeding issues if you don't, if you do that, then you don't really have that issue that I've seen. So uh, if, as long as you finish all sides and, and finish the cut ends, I think wood siding behaves a lot differently than if it's completely unfinished on the back. So that's the short answer. Um, another important thing with wood siding is to keep it dry, right? If you let it get wet, all the pieces will be bigger. Then you put them up and paint them, they all shrink, and you have a line at every piece. So it's really important to keep it dry. Yeah. Go ahead. In the old days when I built my house, uh -huh. I have cedar siding, and we bought it, primed, and finished. Right. Is that still, and it's great. It is available to get pre. The, the question is, can you still get pre-finished cedar siding? And the answer is yes, comma. But I think uh, Mark, didn't you just recently? No, it's windows. We've rec recently we've been finding that field finish stuff costs less. So in in a lot of cases, we've been doing that. Now siding is different from windows because by the time you lay out all the siding for a house, it covers an acre. Um, so it's kind of hard to paint in the field. Um, but it varies. Anyway, it, as far as I know, that's still available. You could buy, you could buy nails with the heads that already painted. Right. Yeah, that was probably a long time ago. 
Okay. Now you would use Hardy and you wouldn't worry about any of that stuff. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we want to use uh, real nails, not, not uh, trim nails. And they have to go an inch and a quarter into the framing, which is important if you end up putting on layers on the outside, you need longer nails. Um, for paint grade stuff, hot dip galvanize is fine, but if you're doing uh, stain grade siding, which is a mediocre idea, um, doesn't last very long, you want to use stainless nails, otherwise you get those black spots around every nail. Um, this, uh, this is a real uh, question for me. When you're nailing up a piece of siding, do you nail right at the bottom and go through the piece below it? Or do you follow what it says in the guidebook and go above the piece below it so your nail is like an inch and a half above the bottom of the piece and you're nailing into the hollow and it splits the board while you're doing it? Uh, you know, uh, I think my, my bottom line on this is, um, like everyone in this room who's ever swung a hammer, we all know that you can nail through both pieces and it usually doesn't do anything wrong. It doesn't, do, it doesn't have any bad outcome. But we have done some houses with wider siding where we nailed through both pieces and then the pieces split when they shrank. So we've replaced entire houses full of siding because every piece almost split. So don't do it if it's much over six inches is what I would say is a realistic answer to that question. Everybody, what do you, what do you guys think? Make sense? Anyone else ever seen it split? Okay, yeah. maybe that's even uh, too conservative. All right, uh, another important thing with uh, wood siding is, is they now want you to keep it two inches off of a roof, um, which is the same as stucco and the same as hardy, which is why we have the same kind of detail, which is a piece of metal um, or a piece of plastic trim that runs along the roof and covers up the bottom two inches. Um, Make sure you check in with your architect or homeowner before you execute this detail. Because uh, they, they may prefer to take a warranty exclusion and have the siding go down to the roof, depending. OK. We don't do a whole lot of cedar shingles, so I'll just go over this real quick. Um, they do have publish a book. I didn't print them out for everybody because we don't do very much of this. But uh, there are, it's the same sort of guidelines, what nails, how far apart to use, the exposure and all that stuff. Um, it is really interesting information. Um, I, didn't, I was flipping through it uh, last week. I didn't, I, it was a good reminder of a lot of that stuff. Um, one thing I will say on this is the cedar breather type uh, mesh backup may, is good for breathability. It's good for paint durability. So it's a nice option. Um, it's not really required. And then one other interesting thing in that book is uh, you know with, with siding, you're gonna nail to the studs. So what's in front of the studs doesn't really matter. But with shingles, they're nailing to the sheathing. So the cedar shake and shingle bureau is really worried about things other than plywood and dimensional lumber. What does that leave? OSB, right? So this is basically saying, if you're nailing up over OSB, be careful. So. I, you might want to switch over to plywood if someone wants to do cedar shingles on a wall. All right. So let's talk about fiber cement. This is what we actually use. Um, my personal opinion is that Hardy has a very good record in our climate and other brands do not. Uh, now I know I get pictures on the internet from people in northern Pennsylvania and Iowa where Hardy has freeze thaw issues, but I've never seen it here. But I have seen freeze thaw issues with other brands. So if you let this stuff soak water up by not having that clearance, you can have big issues. Anyway, I would stick with Hardy and I would install it per directions. So what are the directions? Well, Hardy publishes a really nice uh, best practices manual. It's a, it's a really nice book. Besides having all the bottom line directions, it has lots of tips and extra details how you can make these things work. Um, so there's one of those in each of your notebooks, so that'll be helpful. Um, let me cover a couple of the key things. Uh, first of all, fiber cement needs to be six inches above grade. That's pretty important. Um, I feel like our clients sometimes trap us into trying to be too close to grade, and it's something to keep your eye out for. Uh, we want a two-inch clearance from a roof for a hard surface, a paved, paved surface. Um, you can see in that drawing on the left what it would look like if you had two inches of gap under your siding. It's a pretty big gap. Uh, so I, I like this detail better. You know, it's, took this right out of their book 
where you bend up a piece of metal to cover it. I think usually we actually end up using a piece of PVC mostly though, right? I know that's what we did on the most, most recent couple of projects. So anything that, that gets between the roof and the siding works, works good. A um, couple things on how you make the joints. We do want a piece of flashing behind each joint. The joints are supposed to be on studs. And uh, so Hardy has two different directions. They say you can, if you put the pieces in quote unquote moderate contact, then you don't caulk them. And for their color, pre-finished color match stuff, you, you, that's what you're supposed to do. Because if you put caulk on the joint, it'll change a different color later and it'll look bad. So they want you to not use any caulk. If you're painting it later, you can leave a gap and caulk it, but you don't have to. John, you, you're, you've just recently seen some hardy issues, haven't you? Uh, not, not, not really. Okay, okay. Okay, great. <clears throat> and the other thing is we wanna seal all the cut edges. So uh, Hardy actually makes like a little thing. It kind of looks like those old shoe polish dispensers. You know, it's got like a foam thing on the, on the top and, you, and, and paint inside. So every time you make a cut, you just run that down the edge. So you want to cut, seal all those cut edges. That's important. And uh, one other th important thing with this stuff is where you nail it. So we actually, we were working on a, a rescue project where things had gone bad with the previous contractor. They had some very wavy and loose uh, siding. In fact, I think, it, I think they said it moved in the wind, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, the, the diagnosis was the nails were too high. And so the boards weren't really being held down against the wall. So they, the nails need to be three quarters to an inch below the top. And uh, the vertical has some extra instructions. I thought this was interesting. The nails need to be longer. I'm not really clear why, but that is in their directions. And they do point out that if you're doing a furring strip installation, then the furring strips have to be much thicker than normal because of the extra holding power required. So that might come into play if you're working on a SIPS project. You have to put furring strips in front of the SIPS, then you need really thick ones for vertical. And here's another great example from the best practices guide about how to do a difficult detail. I thought this was really great. So when you're working with vertical siding, how you do the head trim and head flashing on a window is a little bit complicated because you have all these multiple thickness layers to work with, uh, particularly if it's board and batten. So here's how they have you do it. You cut a piece that's as thick as the siding and put it above the window with a piece of flashing over top of it. Then you install all the vertical siding around it. Then you put the window trim on, tucked up under the flashing. So I thought, that's genius. That's a really good way to do this. Because uh, it ends up being a big head scratcher on some of our projects, like uh, one of the barns we did. Um, I think we built like two layers first and flashed it, and then we did the siding around it. I mean, it got complicated, right? Not that complicated. All right, I thought it was complicated. Okay, any questions on the Hardy stuff? All right, synthetic siding. Uh, the Boral guys were down there. They're really excited. They're making their synthetic trim in siding shapes, and I think they think it's going to take over the universe. Um, you know, it might be a great product. I think it's kind of expensive right now. Um, we definitely want to follow their directions for installation. And uh, because water cannot evaporate through it, we're definitely going to need a drainage and ventilation space behind any synthetic siding like that. Okay, so uh, vinyl siding and aluminum, different. They have a big space behind them and a lot of cracks in the system. But any of these things that are em emulate a board, we got to put a gap behind them. Okay. Okay, so nice segue into synthetic, into trim, unless there are questions about siding. Okay. All right, great. So let's talk about that synthetic trim, boral and PVC. Um, you know, why are we using this stuff? We know, we know it's expensive. We know there are installation hassles and questions. Um, the reason is that wood falls apart. And he, this, uh, this wood is on a project where the clients wanted it painted really dark. I think there was an outside architect specified wood. Uh, we installed wood. And a few years later, with all these joints and holes, uh, it started to fail. So uh, we don't want to use wood, especially on a, on a complicated detail like this, where you just know there's going to be a lot of water getting in. Um, so we're going to switch over to using synthetic trim. Um, so let's focus on these panels here for a second. There's <clears throat> we've had the occasion, the opportunity, to take apart 
a number of panels built, built by others, some built by us, and they always leak a lot. So I feel like these details where there's a sort of a panel design like, like this, um, you really have to treat these with a lot of respect. Um, you're going to get a lot of water in them. There's, there's going to be a lot of paint issues and stuff. So <clears throat> uh, as I said, I think the way to go with these, um, because hardy panel is thin, because it allows moisture to escape, and because it's less expensive, I think it's the way to go for the back part of the panel. Um, sometimes we've tried using PVC, but it moves so much and it doesn't let any moisture escape. I just think that's a bad idea. It's also way more expensive anyway. Uh, but we're definitely going to want to have a vent space behind all this stuff because you know water's going to get in and you need to let the water get out. With a vent space, mm -hmm. would you see like a head flashing under the or At the bottom of the window, the, the top of the, window, of the window, window, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in this case, these are self-flashed windows. Right. Right. Yep. All the details should be pretty much the same. Go ahead, George. I mean, it's sort of the same question. I mean, do you have a section detail or somebody? I mean, somebody published a great section detail that I mean, Bobby can start incorporating and we can start learning from, or I mean, for this specific design issue? I haven't seen one, but it's pretty much this moved out 3 sixteenths of an inch with something behind it. And that's the advantage of these thin drainage membranes. Sorry, the question is, are there suction details published for doing this with a drainage space? And the answer is, I'm, I haven't seen them, but they're very easy to execute. I mean, it's, it's just a spacer behind everything. I, I just worry, it's just a spacer with 3 sixteenths of an inch when you get to a window trim detail then, uh -huh. that wasn't accounted for. That now you have an awkward dimension in the field, you know, set the windows or something, so. Could be. Okay. All right, so PVC trim we've been using for, I don't know, a couple decades. Uh, this is a house, we were remodeling the rest of this house, and this is part of the house that was there when we got there. Uh, long rake boards, e each side of these joints probably 15 or 20 feet. And so you can see how much this stuff shrinks. Uh, when it gets cold, it changes length significantly. Even if it's nailed well, it can be about a half an inch of movement. And uh, if it's not nailed well, it's more. So uh, a couple things we have learned, if you cut everything long, if it's warm out, cut everything really long and squeeze it into place, use a bunch of screws at the end, try to glue the joints together, those help a little. But the stuff just moves a lot. Uh, so there are other things you can do. Um, and one of the key things is explain it to the clients. They can have trim that rots, they can have trim that costs a whole lot of money or they can have PVC trim, which is kind of in the middle. No rot, medium amount of money, and uh, little gaps in the winter. Most of our clients have been okay with it when we do a reasonable job. Here's an example of another way to handle PVC movement. It's by adding layers in front of where the joints are. So this is a, a house where the clients were dissatisfied with some visible joints over, uh, let's see if I can get this to work. There we go. Over here you can see the the joints showing up. Um, so what we did is we just put a whole layer on top of the area where all the movement was showing up. Um, you can see that over here. And that covered them. So this is a simple way to deal with PVC movement, cover all the joints. And you can do it on a large scale. So this is a, this, it's hard to guess the scale of this. I don't know if you can see there's a person standing in the corner. Um, it's well over 20 feet tall and it's even over 20 feet wide. So PVC comes in how long is the biggest pieces? 18 feet, right? So there's joints in both directions on this. And in the winter, the joints got to be really big. So particularly, I think there's a joint in the verticals right about here and here, and they would open up quite a bit. And then all these horizontal ones had a joint about here and they would open up quite a bit. So what we did, we added three extra uh, trim strips across horizontally and we covered all the vertical joints under the trim strips. So all the vertical pieces were now like six feet long and they didn't move very much anyway but they were all covered and then all the horizontal pieces we ran between the vertical pieces so they were also short. So all this stuff still shrinks and changes size 
but the amount that, that gets concentrated at each joint is much smaller because all the boards are like one third as long as they used to be, except for those long trim strips. Those still get big gaps. But that worked pretty good. So if you're, if you're careful with how you do the synthetic trim, you can make it work out. So another answer is to use boral trim. Boral trim, uh, we used on this project about, was well, probably four or five years ago now, right? Uh, yeah. Um, this was, a, you know, it's a Tudor style, so we're painting it almost black. We couldn't use PVC because PVC cannot be painted very dark colors. So we used boral. Um, there were limited sizes. It was expensive. It's dusty, but it worked okay. Uh, here's Danze and Jorge uh, fixing up some wood trim, replacing it with boral and fiber cement. Uh, Dante, you told me that it worked out pretty good. Yes. Yeah. It's a little bit hard to move around, right? It's not very uh, Right. Now, did, was that an experiment when you dropped the piece on the ground? Uh, no, the guy at TW Perry dropped it. And how many pieces did it break into? Four or five pieces. Okay. It's pretty brittle. So carry it vertically, you know, two people if you're carrying a long piece, and don't drop it because it'll break into four or five pieces. Uh, one other thing we learned, the grain pattern. Now, most of the trim materials that we use don't are smooth, but this stuff has a wood grain on one side. So if you use it, make sure you warn the painters not to smear filler all over it and then sand it out because the grain disappears. So you gotta be gotta be pretty careful with that. All right, any questions on synthetic trim? All right. I'm not, I'm not sure if I can put it wrong. Oh really? Okay. Huh. Is that right? Did we? I should have gone to that field training. <clears throat> so the question is, is boral, there's a smooth side and a grain side. Can you use both sides? Did you say you, you know? Yeah, he, he told us it was not treated on the other side. Not treated on the other side. So it has to be grain side out. That's a good one. I didn't know that. Thanks for bringing that up. Okay. <clears throat> can you order it without the wood grain? Yeah. It's a really good looking wood grain. I mean, it's very realistic. They even have mill chatter on some pieces. <laughs> it's kind of cool. OK. All right, moving on. Let's talk about stucco. Uh, with stucco, the keys are not the stucco per se. It's the stuff below the surface. Uh, water management and all the reinforcement. So I didn't print out the 68-page uh, Minnesota Lath and Plaster Bureau guide, which is awesome, awesome guide. But I can print it for you if you're doing stucco. So I just didn't want to print that for everybody yet. Uh, let me know. Bring, bring you a copy. It's a really great, really, uh, really nice book. Um, manufacturers of materials also have important information that should be reviewed. The, you know, if you're using Sonneborn or Parex top coat, there's going to be different requirements than in the Minnesota book. So let's keep it simple on the, on the back here. Tyvek, felt, and drain gap is what we are normally going to use behind stucco. So in this picture, you can see the Tyvek on the whole wall, felt, and then this drain gap material with the mesh in front to keep the mortar out of it. Then we're going to put our lath on top of all that and do stucco. It is possible that on a, like a one-story house with a big overhang, you could, do, you could leave out the drain gap material. Uh, but on most of our houses, we're going to have parts of the house that have a lot of exposure. They're going to get very wet. We really want to have that drain gap for it. Um, one other thing I will say, the stucco wrap is really nice material. Uh, it's stucco that comes pre-crinkled. So I don't know if you guys can see that. It makes little drainage channels. So if you, if you have this behind the felt layer, you have a pretty good drainage. So it's a nice upgrade. Uh, you have to switch over to 3-inch tape, and this stuff is more expensive. So I'm not sure it's worth it. But uh, if you want to pass it around, you can. It is a nice, it does drain well. So one of the big questions with, if you have water all the way at the stucco wrap layer, you're in trouble. Uh, yep, but uh, you know, these houses are gonna be around for a lot longer than we're gonna be watching the caulking. So, you know, I've, I've seen even houses we built 20 years ago, the caulking does fail eventually. And, People aren't always out there inspecting it every month like it probably says somewhere they should. 
Okay, so one of the weird things with stucco is uh, all those layers need to terminate above grade. But I think most clients have this picture in their head. If they're picking stucco, they're picking like a uniform vi vision from the ground to the soffit, right? They just want this smooth wall the whole way. They don't necessarily have it in their mind that there's going to be a line where flashing sticks out two inches below the bottom of the framing. And that's what's in all the books. In fact, it's in code. We, we really were supposed to do that. So the question is, how do you handle that where you need to put a line in for all these layers to terminate and water to come out from behind the stucco? And this is one example of how to do it. Switch over to another material. Um, I actually kind of like this one. Uh, you could switch over to just parging. You, you, know, you can switch over to stone like this. Um, but it's, it is required in code that we do that. So uh, you, know, you have to do something. You can kind of have stucco, line, and stucco. But it's probably something that clients need to understand. Same as with uh, expansion and movement control joints, which we'll talk about in a minute. So lath installation, one of the, one of the things with lath installations, all, all the books I've ever read say the lath fasteners need to go into studs. But half the stucco guys we've worked with just staple the heck out of it all over the place. And uh, I find that a little frustrating. I've, we, we've been able to get them to go back and, and nail stuff to the studs. Um, I, I'm just not sure how important that is at the end of the day. Um, I'm sure there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of houses around here with almost no fasteners in the studs. But I don't know why we wouldn't ask them to do it the way it says to. Uh, they do hold a lot of weight, especially if you're going to stick stone on the face of it. One, uh, one other important thing with lath that I have seen go wrong on our jobs, the lath is supposed to go around outside corners and around inside corners. So you have to put the corner pieces on after the lath is installed. So this picture on the left, uh, there's no lath here. It needed to have been installed before these corner pieces. So that was done wrong. Over on this one, you can see the lath goes under the corner piece, so that's correct. You gotta keep your eye on that. It's weird because uh, half the accessories go on before the lath and the other half go on after. Uh, the lath has to overlap. You can see here you got about a two inch overlap, two inch overlap, two inch overlap, two inch overlap. And the pieces are supposed to offset like this, so it goes, they don't have, they don't all end in the same place vertically. So that's good. So let's talk about movement joints. Uh, this is an example of a movement joint being installed. Um, you can see in that picture, it's actually helping the contractor because they can stop and start in one place. They don't have to do 200 million square feet all in one go. This is an example of the piece that's being installed. Um, so movement joints are confusing because uh, we know stucco will crack if, it, if the pieces are too big or they're funny shaped. Um, but on most houses, they, they don't, they're not laid out the way that the commercial books say they should be. You know, every 18 feet at the most, and 144 square feet, and uh, and all this stuff, and th and they don't really have profound problems. There's like one or two cracks happen on your whole house, and most clients don't want to see these joints all over the place. So, uh, what we've been doing is uh, we we always put them in at a floor line because when the house shrinks, you you really need some movement there. But other than that, um, we've been letting clients sign off on not doing them and accepting some minor cracking. And most clients are okay with that. They'd rather have that than the lines. So that makes sense, right? Okay. All right, around the perimeter of your stucco, you're gonna use a casing bead. It's a piece of metal that makes a little C shape. <clears throat> There's an example of it. So you put that up about 3 eighths of an inch from the edge of your window. And then the stucco, they, they float their trowel on here so it makes it all even, even uh, thickness at the edge. And then there's a 3 inch space that will fill with a top quality sealant. And that makes a pretty good joint because you have enough space. All right. Uh, this is an issue that we've run into. Some of the synthetic top coat stuccos. If you get water, sorry. Sorry to anyone who's looking at this and having bad thoughts. I'm sorry. Um, so we have to keep water out of these 
assemblies. When it's part of a house, we do a pretty good job. We seal all the joints, there's an overhang. When we're building an exterior structure, we really have to think this through. There's got to be little flashings and, and uh, <clears throat> on the top of a masonry wall where you have a piece of bluestone that's going to let water soak in, we're going to have to put a through flashing under that with little drip edges on each side. We've got to keep the water out of this stuff or it'll bubble and pop off. This has actually been a big issue for us and it's you know, our stucco guys, I don't think they still understand it or maybe they feel like it's not their responsibility. Um, the other option is to use traditional hard coat stucco which will get a million uh, spider vein cracks all over it, but it will not pop off the wall. So you, you have your clients pick their poison. Uh, the synthetics are very flexible so they don't crack, but they, they do do this. So I, I think I'd probably go with tradition, traditional hard coat. Any questions on stucco? Okay, remember we have that big book you can read before you have to actually supervise it. Basically it's the same waterproofing details whether it's on the house or it's a retaining wall. Sometimes. Question is, is it the same waterproofing on a house or on a retaining wall? It's actually pretty different I think because you don't, you don't really care about behind the stucco. It can adhere directly to the retaining wall, but you really care about water getting in the top of it. Yeah which doesn't really happen on a house normally. Okay. Okay, let's uh, cover adhered stone really quick. Um, I don't think we're doing a whole lot of synthetic adhered stone, you know, cultured stone. Our clients are way too classy for that, but we are doing a lot of stick-on real stone, thin stone application. So there's, there's two different books. Um, <clears throat> the uh, artificial stone one is actually a little bit better than the real stone one. So uh, I would encourage you, if you're doing any of this stuff, to get both of these. I can print them out for you. They're not in the books. Again, it'd be another like 80 pages. Um, so you got to be careful with this stuff. Stucco with brain shelves is what the building consultants call it. It really absorbs a lot of water. Now you can see on this one, there, most of this issue is at the roof line where there's probably a bad kick out. But uh, even above that, it looks pretty tattered. Uh, it's a bit, been, a, been a bad day on this house, a bad year. Um, so we're definitely going to use a drainage gap behind this stuff. Uh, it absorbs too much water for us to manage without having that space. So two layers of water-resistive barrier and a drain cavity. Um, another couple little details. Um, if you have a projection, which many of our houses do, if it's over two and five-eighths of an inch, we're supposed to use a steel hanger to hold it on the house because more than that is too much weight for the backup to hold, according to the engineers. Um, and then at the bottom of the house, we kind of have that same issue with the stucco, only it's even more complicated because how do you draw a horizontal line in a random stone pattern? Uh, and on top of that, both the thin stone and the cultured stone people say, stop this stuff four inches above grade, which I think would look really weird, right? You'd have this nice solid stone and then, the, then it goes back two inches and then down four inches and then there's your grade. I mean, I think that would be a terrible look. So we've, uh, we've tried to deal with this a few different ways. Um, we definitely want to cut off the drainage plane and, and get all that water to the outside before you get down to the dirt. Uh, you can see in this example, we're trying to work the flashing in between the, the random stones. And they sort of made most of them a little bit above and a little bit below. Um, you know, I, I can't make up my mind if this is genius or or just a really a lot of work for not a lot of benefit. Um, I sometimes think if, if we explain to the client that they'll have solid parging from a horizontal line down to grade, that would make more sense, right? You could just parge the foundation from the termination down. Uh, but you can do this. Um, there are a couple of other options too. Um, <clears throat> planting bushes is a good option, correct. <clears throat> So I think if you this you know this whole assembly is a couple inches thick, maybe two and a half, right? So I think if I think you could in principle put two and a half inches of parging below it. Although our, we recently talked to a subcontractor who said that's too much parging, but we we're building something that exact same thickness directly above it. So I'm not, I, I don't know. I wish I had a great answer. I'll put it that way. So this is how the book shows the drawing, and just as with stucco, there's a required weep screed at the framing line where water exits the assembly. Um, in the adhered stone book, 
you are allowed to carry the whole assembly, including the drainage material, all the way down the foundation until you get to wherever you want to stop. So I think that makes some sense, right? Just run all the layers down further. And the third way is to have the stop and then just start with the stone again directly on the foundation. This is more or less what we've been doing. Uh, we put the stop in, we try to disguise it, and then we just continue on down below with the stone again. <clears throat> so I don't know, I find this to be a big head scratcher, but um, this is what we've been doing lately. And uh, maybe we should just switch over to only horizontal stone patterns. That would help a lot, yeah. All right, any questions on adhered stone? Okay. So you, you cut that flashing after the fact? Yes, it doesn't look like this forever, right? After w all these through flashings that you'll see, uh, we leave them sticking out until the mortar is on, and then we cut them off flush with the mortar, and it makes a very thin line that's nearly imperceptible, except to an inspector who's supposed to be checking it. <clears throat> How about the ropes? Um, yeah, we'll talk about that in brick. I mean, they don't conduct as much water as a person might think. Um, a lot of masons like to use them. Uh, they do hold a hole open, which is nice. If you just leave it there and then yank it out when you're done, that works good. Okay. So let's talk about brick and stone. Okay, there's a really, really nice book in your, uh, in your book, the Brick and Stone uh, Michigan Masonry Institute, I think it's called, uh, the Guide to Inspecting Residential Brick Veneer. Really clear drawings, very easy to show a mason and explain. I think Mark Colza got one of our uh, most traditional, shall we say, uh, masonry crews to immediately start putting in through flashings correctly just by showing them the drawings. So uh, really great, really great book. Um, so let's talk about brick first. It's a reservoir cladding, so we definitely need two weather-resistive barriers, one of which should be felt because it's low perm. So Tyvek and felt is our standard behind brick. We don't necessarily need a drainage gap because brick is away from the wall, so there is a drainage gap. On the other hand, with stone, they're packing mortar behind the stone up to the wall. So we need a drainage gap, and it has to be one of these ones with the fabric in front to stop any of the mortar from getting in. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, I didn't define it, so it's a good question. So a reservoir cladding is something that water can soak into and stay in, and it's especially susceptible to sun-driven moisture. So a wet stone wall, when the sun hits it, an incredible amount of moisture is pushed into the wall. Does that make sense? So stone brick. Stone brick, stucco, adhered masonry, and some people argue fiber cement. But I don't, because it doesn't hold much. Okay, so we're gonna use a drainage gap on stone. Uh, one thing that is a great way of explaining this to the new person on the block is, uh, you have to think of masonry as though it were like a stack of sponges. Um, of course, it's, it's nowhere near as absorbent as a real sponge, but if you blow rain on it for three days, it'll seem like it, because you'll just have water trickling down through that whole assembly. And it's gonna go somewhere, and then you had better have something that goes behind it, comes through it, and comes out where you want it, because that's where the water's going. Otherwise, it's going into the house. So uh, we always are gonna use uh, flashings that go through the assembly and direct the water out. Uh, where do we use them? Definitely at the base of the wall, at, uh, at any row locks and lintels, so above and below windows. This is all in code. Um, and also there's some tricky locations. So these are really simple, right? This is very easy. This is the drawing you show and they, they're like, oh, I get it, I can do that. Um, very simple to execute, very easy to do. Uh, it does get tricky at roof lines, including bay windows. So here's how we do it at, the, at a roof line. Uh, we have the masons build a stepped assembly. All these steps have to be very even and equal or it'll look really silly when you're done. And uh, they also probably should be smaller than they are in this picture. These are eight inch vertical steps and clients think that's a little bit big. So something's half or a little bit bigger, two bricks or four inches seems to be more acceptable. You cover all that with a masonry through flashing, flexible seal masonry through flashing. Um, 
tuck that under the wall cladding and you're watertight right now. You can spray water on it and all the water's coming out on the roof. Then you put metal pieces on top. We need the metal because the metal will be sticking out for, to receive the roof flashings. <clears throat> and uh, the flexible flashings cannot stick out. They don't, they're not UV resistant, only the metal is. So you continue up with the masonry. Then the roofers come. They put the roofing down on the roof. They turn it up the wall with step flashing or the edge of the pan. Then they install a counter flashing between the roofing and the bottom of those pans. They bend the pans down and voila. So it's pretty simple once you, once you have it all in your head, but uh, there's a lot, a lot to the actual execution. Um, in particular, keeping those steps nice and even seems to be a real challenge. And then when you get to the top of the roof or you're going around a chimney, there's all these kind of corner elevations. It can be a bit of a head scratcher. Uh, I think we've found it's helpful if we're up there helping, generally speaking. Is that, is that fair to say? Maybe. <clears throat> that is copper that we used going through, so it's copper to copper. Um, no, if they're all bent down in the correct order, they don't need to be soldered. Um, does that make sense? So it's gravity. Okay. Uh, on top of a bay window, um, you know, you'll have a, a rectangular hole in the wall where your bay window is going to attach, and they'll bring the brick up on each side and lay a lintel across. And then they'll continue up with the brick, and then you build a roof that goes up to the brick. So now if water is running down in the brick, and it gets to that lintel and comes out to the front of the lintel and pours out, where is it pouring out? Yeah, it's on the ceiling of the bay window. So you need another through flashing up above the bay window. And really, in a lot of ways, it's probably better if you, you can see the weep holes here. We pull, we pull, we pull. So they put a through flashing in at that level all the way across here. Probably better if you actually step it down. But you got to do one or the other. That's good. It's not much that can leak if it's up there. It's not much. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I even read uh, one of the books that, uh, that's on our wiki thing. It talks about making a channel on the lintel and then directing that sideways, but that seems kind of kind of risky. I think it's better to just do another through flashing at the top. Okay, another important thing with these through flashings uh, is putting an end dam wherever you transition. Um, first of all, when, when it ends, obviously, um, so you want to fold it up so water can't, all this water that's coming, running down, can't just pour off the end into the house. Um, but another place that I think it's important is when you have two, when you have long piece and you have a joint, I think it's better to turn both of the joints up in a joint in the masonry because water can't get through that, right? There's no, there's no lack of seal between the two pieces. You don't have an issue with that. So I have seen this a couple of times now where people have tried to put in through flashings and they, they join them and they're not quite sealed and water leaks into the house through the, through the joint. So I like doing the end dams instead. In order to do these correctly, you need to have a lot of extra, right? This is why we run the pieces like 10 or 12 inches wild on each end of a window. So you can turn it up in the joint that's in the right place as well. Okay, we talked about this before. There's, uh, there's a few materials that are great and one that's widely used but is terrible. So let's pay attention to this when our masons show up. Um, this green grace perma barrier is great stuff. Good stuff, green plastic face. CCW705, very good stuff. This is perfectly acceptable. Homan and Bernard Textro Flash. Uh, this is what they sell at Tri-State Stone now, so we see it on a lot of our jobs. Henry Blueskin TWF, also very good. All these materials are made to be masonry through wall flashings. Unfortunately, a lot of the yards around here still sell the York PVC, which says on the directions not for use as a masonry through wall flashing but uh, they still sell it and people still use it. So we have to watch out if our masons show up with this thin black material that's shiny on one side and textured on the other, that's gotta go out the window, okay? Uh, and if they show up with something else, uh, I don't know, give me a call or read the directions, see if it's made to be a masonry through wall flashing. Could be good stuff. And I wanna talk about weeps too. There's a bunch of good weep products, let's see. 
<coughs> this is uh, this is made by Masonry Technologies Inc. It's this corrugated plastic. Um, once you trim this off, all you're looking at is a couple of little holes, but it's definitely a nice wide opening. So I really like that. We can mail order that. Um, this is some other stuff. This is especially made for the head joints of bricks. Instead of just a little tube, you have the whole head joint open. I think I feel like that's good for ventilation, and you can see it matches the color of your brick or your mortar. So that's kind of cool. Um, so if you have water coming down behind the brick, you gotta you gotta prevent the mortar that falls off the back of the brick from clogging those holes at the bottom. There's a couple of different ways to do that. There's materials that are specially made for this, you know, thicker, heavier meshes. Um, I'm starting to think that it might make as much sense to just take a 12 or 18 inch wide piece of the um, one of these materials and just put that at the bottom because you you know you can pile you can pile mortar up pretty high on this and still have a really clear path. Um, and I was recently on a project where um, there were occasional blobs of mortar touching the felt on the house, and it was. You know, the water was soaking through that and damaging the felt. So I feel like if you have a big pile of mortar on top of a, on top of a piece like what we have in this picture, it might, might end up making a wet area. And if you use a whole wide piece, it just can't do that. Anyway, we gotta do something at the bottom of the cavity. Um, talk about anchors real quick. Um, 16 by 24 inch spacing. They're supposed to attach to the studs. That's something that some crews are not aware of. So we need to be on that. Uh, they have to be hot dip galvanized or stainless. Hot dip galvanized lasts like 25 years in a masonry wall. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I've, I think the stainless ones are two or 300 bucks more on a house. Uh, probably a nice upgrade on some of our houses. And uh, you have to terminate it five eighths of an inch back. If you go out further, it really starts to rust fast. Okay, so here's something that, uh, that's actually pretty important. Um, so someone built this house in Great Falls. It has a, you know, a basement wall with three plates and then a two by 10 floor system and then another first floor wall with three plates and then another two by 10 floor system. And between the time when they installed the windows on the second floor and built the brick veneer up to the very bottom of the window, and when we got to look at this house 10 years later, all that wood had shrunk probably half an inch. And now the windowsill, I don't know if you can see the shadow, <clears throat> the windowsill's tilted back into the house, you know, half an inch. So this is really important, and I've seen this on a bunch of houses. Um, we really need to leave a substantial gap between masonry and windows and doors on a new house. Now, if you're working on a remodeled house where all that shrinkage already happened, it's a different story but we really need to leave a big space. To me, the side and top aren't nearly as important. Um, you know, window manufacturers say that their windows need room to expand and contract. Yeah, I don't know. I have never seen an issue with that. Has anyone, anyone here seen an issue with that? On the sides or the top? Okay, just at the bottom. All right, any questions on masonry? Okay, we're almost done. I see we're running out of time here. A um, couple of quick things. There's some unusual new things on the market, this so-called screen type siding where you have pieces of wood with gaps between them. Um, I took a picture of this because I thought the workmanship was so uh, crappy. You can see the things going up and down. This is a, a commercial building in a town near me. Um, <clears throat> the issue with these is light goes through them to the weather resistive barrier and all the weather resistive barriers are not UV resistant. Someone came out with one of the big fanfare a couple of years ago, and it, it will last for 10 years. So that's way better than felt, but is that how long our building's supposed to last? I guess if you build it this way, it probably only will. Um, these are something that I think, I don't know if we'll ever use these, but I think they're really cool. I think they're coming on the market, and there's a sort of contemporary trend in the market now. Um, these panels that attach with clips. One thing, I did talk to a guy who did one of these, and he had he had the installers test the system with a spray rack just to be sure that it was working, and uh, the fasteners all leaked. So if we get into one of these systems, we're going to want to do that kind of testing. And then uh, another quick thing on these glazing systems, they always, have a, they always have water entry points and places where the water runs through and runs out. So we have to learn about those before we build the things around them so that we're managing the water that's going through it right at the bottom 
Read the manual. And then one last quick thing. Uh, occasionally we do projects with SIPs. Um, if you read the siding books, they want you to add three quarters or an inch and three quarter of wood to the outside of the structural insulating panel for the siding to hang onto. So uh, that's something to keep in mind when you're detailing these out or pricing them out. And because they're, you know, it's a structural panel, the OSB skin is the structure. We really have to protect that, so we're definitely going to want to use a drainage space on those. Make sense? Okay. That's it. Thanks for your patience, everyone. I know I went a little over. All right. <clears throat>